Hi everyone and welcome to my home office where from this location and others across the world we are bringing you native script on Firebase. Cute title I know, but be prepared for some awesome content. Now today we have the pleasure of diving into Google's uber popular Firebase platform. But specifically we're going to focus on the usage of some of its most critical services with relation to mobile app development. And it's a safe guess that since this is a progress hosted webinar, and the fact that Progress is the company behind NativeScript, our content will focus on making the most out of using Firebase with NativeScript for your cross-platform native app development needs. Now, as usual, before we really get started here, I need to run you through some logistics hoops very quickly to make sure you have the best experience as possible today. First off, if you can't hear me, haven't been able to hear me at any time in the last couple minutes, or at some point in the future, your audio just cuts out, please try connecting with your computer audio, not your phone. This issue comes up often with GoToWebinar. If nothing seems to help, just restart your GoToWebinar viewer and all should be okay. But if it's not okay, if absolutely nothing works during our webinar today, or maybe you wanna watch every glorious moment again, you will be receiving a follow-up email with a link directly to the recording on YouTube. We will also be sure to send some links to other resources we provide today. And for those of you who know NativeScript already, or if you've attended webinar, one of our webinars in the past, you know I can't start without at least giving a call out to the NativeScript framework itself. NativeScript lets you take your web skills and translate those into creating truly native mobile apps for both iOS and Android. You use a single code base with JavaScript or TypeScript, with CSS for styling, and optionally use popular frameworks like Angular, Vue, or no framework at all, we even have community-supported React and Svelte integrations. But the quickest way to get started with NativeScript is on the web-based NativeScript playground at play.nativescript.org. You can access some great tutorials there. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at NativeScript and subscribe to our monthly newsletter at nativescript.org news. And join us on Slack where we have 13,000 and counting community members ready to help you out. And when you do this, you'll join a growing community of folks who have now downloaded NativeScript well over 6 million times. Okay, end of logistics. Let's introduce our speakers. So this guy in the bottom right corner who has been blabbing at you, that's me, Rob Lauer. I manage the mobility wing of developer relations here at Progress. Along with me today here is the illustrious TJ Van Toll, our principal developer advocate. And NativeScript plugin expert Eddie Verbruggen is also in the house. Eddie is a hero to many of us for his work on plugins and is the main figure behind the NativeScript Firebase plugin that will feature so prominently in our story today. But before I hand you over to TJ, I do want to talk about what exactly this Firebase thing is. So what is Firebase? Well, it's kind of like asking what is Azure or what is AWS. At the end of the day, these are collections of services that enable you to build your apps faster on top of reliable cloud-based infrastructure. In fact, Google just calls it a comprehensive app development platform, and that seems pretty accurate. So what are these features that enable us to be so successful with Firebase? Well, we can focus on how Firebase enables us to add engaging features and build better apps with exciting capabilities like Firestore, machine learning, cloud functions, and authentication. We can effortlessly scale and grow our business by relying on the cloud infrastructure of Firebase and Google, combined with messaging and analytics and A-B testing. Finally, we can see how Firebase can help improve the quality of our apps with comprehensive crash reporting and performance metrics. So which of these features apply to native script development? While many of these do, we wanna really highlight analytics, authentication, Firestore, cloud functions, in-app and cloud messaging, crashlytics, dynamic links, ML kit, performance monitoring, real-time DB, remote config, and storage. Whew. But of course, we can't literally cover everything today. So instead, we're gonna kinda try and focus on first the general setup of your Firebase instance, and then look into Firestore, authentication, analytics, crashlytics, cloud functions, messaging, and a bit of machine learning with ML kit. Okay, yeah, that's still a lot today. Now, if you stick around to the end, I will have the proverbial one more thing to show you. 
By now you likely know the NativeScript framework is free and open source, and it always will be. And it's a great way to build iOS and Android apps from scratch. But what if you want to rapidly create multiple apps or quickly scaffold in some additional views, maybe get some of the tedious boilerplate out of the way before you start the real coding work? Well, stay tuned to the end and I'll show off some ideas we have for NativeScript Sidekick 2.0. While it's a little too early to dive into the details, I've got some cool concepts to show you and a sign up form to give you early access in 2020. So that is our agenda today. Let's go ahead and really kick things off here by virtually passing the mic over to TJ Van Tol. TJ, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. I'm TJ from the NativeScript team, and I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about NativeScript and Firebase. And specifically, I'm going to cover a handful of topics. We'll start with setup, just so that you know how to integrate Firebase into your NativeScript apps. From there, we'll take a thorough look at Firebase's powerful backend data store, Firestore. And then we'll take a brief look at Firebase's authentication and analytics offerings. Now, we'll talk about each of these features in turn, go into a little bit of depth, and we'll do so by helping a hypothetical organization, Acme, build a simple little ticketing application. So just a simple little app built off Firebase to showcase some of these features in action. And to start doing this, I'm going to switch over to my browser. There we go. And you'll see that I have it open to the NativeScript marketplace at market.nativescript.org, as it's where all NativeScript plugins live, including, if I do a search, the NativeScript Firebase plugin. The Firebase plugin has some really excellent documentation, which is definitely worth reading over. You'll see all the various features listed and whatnot. And if you keep scrolling down, you'll see that the first section talks about setup. And it'll instruct you to create a new Firebase account at the Firebase console, which is available at console.firebase.google.com. Which, if you head there, after you create an account, you'll see this screen of projects. So the first thing you'll want to do is click this Add Project button. Now, I do already have a project set up for Acme just to save us a little bit of time. And when you go into a project, you'll see essentially this is the main Firebase dashboard. This is where you'll be spending a lot of your time. And you'll see the menu on the left hand side of the screen lists a lot of the features, a lot of the things about Firebase that we'll be talking about here today. Now, before we get started actually using this in an app, there is one additional thing we need to do. And we need to register each individual app or each platform that we want to use this Firebase backend with. So I'm going to register an app, and I will do so for iOS, and I will need to provide my bundle ID, which for NativeScript you can find in your package.json file. Now this is a simple demo, so I'm just using a generic de demo bundle ID for now. So I'll register this app, and this is going to, as a next step, give me a config file. You will want to download this file because you'll need this in a second. You'll need to actually import this file into your NativeScript app. And the rest of the steps you can actually skip because the Firebase plugin is going to take care of all of this for you. Now next, I could go through all of these same steps for Android as well. You'll see that Android needs a, a package ID, so basically the same bundle ID. But for now, for this simple app, I'm only going to be testing in iOS. So we'll keep our lives easy and just stick with iOS for now. Now at this point, all of our initial console setup is complete. So I'm going to switch over to my, let's see, Visual Studio Code, my editor, and my simulator, where I've got to start on the NativeScript Acme app, which you'll see is basically empty at the moment. Now, to set up Firebase, the first thing I want to do is, if you'll remember that uh, Google Service Info plist file that I downloaded when I went through the console setup, you'll need to place this in your app resources folder. So there's a file for iOS, and if you go through the Android setup, you'll get a file for Android as well that you'll need to toss into your Android folder. From there, you'll need to next install the Firebase plugin, which from your terminal within your project, you can do using the TNS plugin add command and pass that NativeScript plugin Firebase. Now this is gonna prompt me for, with a number of questions to basically configure how I want Firebase to be used. So it's gonna ask me about different platforms I'm using, different features I'm using, uh, a lot of the things that you'll see that we are talking about today. And I'm gonna say no to both of this because what the plugin's actually doing under the hood is that, as you get a sense by the, the number of questions here, Firebase does a whole lot. And so by being modular like this, the plugin can just sort of avoid shipping code for the features that you're not using. 
And don't worry if you do sort of change your mind, if there are features that you want to use later on, the Plugins Readme does have good documentation on how to add those features later on. And at this point, our setup is both complete in the console and also in this native script app. So what I'm going to do is just start this thing up. So I'm going to run this on an emulator so that we can test this out, deploy it over here. And while this is starting up and running, we can start talking about the first big feature on our list, and that is Firestore. Firestore is Firebase's NoSQL document database. It's essentially just a database that makes it really easy to store, sync, query, get data for your mobile apps. And to do so at really a global scale, this is all running on Google's cloud infrastructure. And personally, what I really like about Firestore is that it's got more of a granular approach in terms of how you store your data compared to other NoSQL databases. I think that's a little bit easier to show in action. So let's head back to the Firebase console for this project that we just set up for Acme. And we'll go to the database section, which is where you'll configure your Firestore setup. And you can see I already have some sort of testing data in here for the Acme app. Now at the highest level, Firestore is just a series of collections and those collections have a series of documents. So in this case, Acme has a tickets collection and that tickets collection contains two documents or two tickets. But with Firestore, you really can nest these structures. So for example, each individual ticket could have a collection of uh, maybe comments or some sort of log of status updates. It can be quite an elegant way to architect your data. It gives you a quite a bit of flexibility in terms of how you store these things while maintaining a lot of the benefits of a NoSQL database. Now to start showing this, the first thing I wanna do is take this data that's in the database section, this Firestore data, and actually get it loaded into our app. So our build is complete at this point. So let's switch back to Visual Studio Code and uh, the application and see how to actually get this running. And actually I've got a little bit wired up here. So if I close some of this out, You'll see that Acme has in this XML file, a little bit of markup in place to display ticket data, but currently the service to actually retrieve this data is basically just boilerplate code. There's, there's no code here to actually go out to a backend and get this, which is going, which is gonna be what we're gonna write. What I'll do is I'll start by going into the app.ts file, which is essentially the entry point for this application. And I'm gonna add in two lines of code, one to just import uh, Firebase from the plugin, and to initialize it, which will take care of calling the, the sort of underlying native SDKs to make sure that everything is set up and ready for us to go. From there, I'm gonna head back to that boilerplate service that I had set up, and I'll paste in again an import to Firebase. And next, what I wanna do is get a reference to the tickets collection. So get a reference to the collection that appears here. And to do so, I will go ahead and set this instance variable equal to uh, Firebase, and there's a Firestore method on the main Firebase object. And I can then call its collection method and pass it the name of the collection I want. So in this case, that's going to be tickets. And then to actually get those tickets, all I need to do, so I get a reference to this tickets collection, all I need to do is call a get method on the tickets collection, and that's going to go ahead and get the data that I need. Really is that simple. Now in a real world app, you do need a little bit more code. So I, to sort of get this working in the Acme app, I added a little bit more boilerplate to, to return a promise API. If you're more hipster than me and more talented, you could do this with sort of async await. I also added a little bit of parsing code to get like IDs and things that this app needs as well, as well as a little bit of air handling so I could handle when things actually go wrong with this data call but it's still pretty powerful that all you need to actually get this data is a really quick, simple call to get. And you'll see there's actually some uh, power in terms of how you can sort of query and, and filter this data as well that's built into Firebase also. To activate this, you'll see that I'm not actually seeing data in this app yet because I need to go to my view layer and add a little bit of code to actually just, just hit that service that I just wrote. And when I do that, you'll see those two tickets appear in my app. And so within a few minutes here, we were able to take this data from the Firebase console and get that loaded over here in this native script application. But this is only the beginning. Obviously, I, I wanted to start simple and show a bit of a hello world, uh, load some data and actually get it into an application because I think Firebase does have a pretty elegant approach to showing this. 
But now that we have this in place, let's let's get into some of the more compelling things that Firestore can do. To do that, I'm going to switch over. So I've got another branch here with a slightly more complex version using Firestore. And I'm going to run that on my emulator. And while this is running, I'm going to bring in my USB connected iOS device because it's already got this more complete version. And because I want to showcase one pretty powerful feature of Firestore, and that's offline access. All collections in Firestore are enabled for offline usage by default. So since I have this app up here, one of the features that this version of the app has is it has a details page. So if I go to this parts needed ticket and I open it up, the idea here is a technician would be out in the field. They'd see that parts are needed here. They would do the work that needed to happen. And then they'd hit this close ticket button when this work is complete. But let's suppose that this worker is in an area where there's bad connectivity. They're offline, which we'll simulate here by turning on airplane mode. And we'll go ahead and close this ticket for parts needed in an offline usage scenario. Now you see within the app and sort of Firebase's local cache, it knows that this ticket is closed right away. But in the backend console, this ticket is still marked open because obviously the device does not have internet access. It's not able to push this change up to the server. But if I take this, so we'll put this up so we can see both the console and the app on my iOS device here side by side. What's cool is that if I restore internet access, so we'll turn airplane mode back off, you'll see that within a second or so, the console gets that update from the device and it syncs it to my backend automatically, which is cool. And you actually don't need any additional code to make this happen. I mentioned that this was a more complete version of the app, but my code to actually retrieve tickets from the backend hasn't actually changed at all. <laughs> I moved a little bit of the parsing logic to its own method. I'm still just calling get on this tickets collection, and I have this offline syncing ability built directly in. Offline syncing is one really cool feature of Firestore. Another is the ability to watch for backend changes, essentially turning your database into a real-time database. So in this version of the app, I've changed the code just a little bit and the code that actually calls that service so that instead of just getting the tickets once, I'm actually watching the tickets instead. And under the hood here in the service, on the collection, so this is the same tickets collection that we got a reference to earlier, Instead of just calling get, like I'm doing up here, instead, I'm calling the plugins on snapshot method, which is going to be invoked by Firebase every time the backend data changes. So for example, let's actually set this up so we've got, uh, we can simulate multiple devices here. So we've got the simulator and then my physical iOS device. And if I go over to the console, let's say, so this ticket is closed. Let's say someone in some other uh, app actually changes this data. They opens up this ticket. Maybe some additional work needs to happen. So as soon as you make this change and you update it, uh, notice how fast these uh, other devices updated as well. So I'll do this one more time so you can, you can watch it a little more. So I hit close and I'll update. And you'll see how quickly that updates across my devices. Hopefully this brief demo just gives you some sense of how powerful Firestore is. And we really are scratching the surface as there's a lot more I could cover. If you are interested in digging deeper into this, I'd recommend checking out the plugins documentation. You'll see there's a section for each feature. And if you go to, let's see, it's Cloud Firestore, you can start scrolling down and get a sense of, so here's the collection API that we were working with. We were working with the tickets collection. Here's the get method I was using on Snapshot for watching. But you'll see there's a whole lot more. You can work with individual documents. You can get snapshots on documents so you can watch things more granularly, add data, update data. Again, there's just a whole lot here that you can explore. But with that, let's move on and use the rest of our time to briefly discuss two additional features of Firebase, and that's its authentication and analytics offerings. We'll start with authentication, as Firebase allows you to both create and store users within Firebase, as well as connect to a number of other providers. To do so, all you need to do is head into the Firebase console. So we're here in the database section now, and we'll switch over to the authentication tab. From there, you'll be prompted to set up a sign-in method. And just by sort of glancing at this page, you can get a sense of just how many options you have with Firebase for dealing with user authentication. 
For our purposes, we'll keep things simple and we'll enable, head up here, email password verification. Firebase even has this uh, kind of cool option where you can actually do a passwordless sign in where every time you go to sign, or every time you go to authenticate, you'll just get an email link that, that'll enable access to the server. But we're just going to keep things the, the dead simplest route, just email password. And with this bit of setup in place, there's actually only one bit of code you need to add to your app itself. So if I switch back over, so we've got our simulator again, and I'll bring back up Visual Studio Code. And in this version of the app, I have a login screen in place. So I just have to change it to be the, the default view for this application. And the user code under the hood is in this user service. And you can get a sense, again, how concise this code is. So again, I import Firebase using that exact same syntax from earlier. And there's a single method that you need to use to actually authenticate a user. And all you have to pass in is the type of login. So in this case, a type of password, but this might be something like Google or Facebook if you're using a, a sort of a social provider or a third party provider, and then just the actual values themselves. So in this case, it's going to be the email and password. This code does return a token. So if this is in a real world app, you'd want to add a, a callback that sort of saved off that token and made it available for subsequent requests. But for this example, all I want to give you a sense is just how easy this code actually is to run and use. And to make it work, there is one additional thing I'll need to do. So over in the actual uh, console here, I do actually have to add a user. So let's type in my email and my super secret don't steal my credentials password. So I will do that. And now if I can manage to switch successfully, I should be able to sign in my user and actually use it within the app. Now, I don't have a demo of every single authentication provider Firebase supports uh, because we don't have hours today to actually dig into this. But I do want to show you a, for you a few different resources. So first, I'll again mention that Fire, the Firebase plugins README is an excellent starting point for any new Firebase feature that you want to use. And so for authentication, you'll find the authentication section here. It's got methods for really all of these different uh, options that Firebase provides. So getting the current user, listening to auth changes, uh, updating profiles. Firebase does anonymous login. It does email password login. So this is the code right here that we just used, including uh, dealing with the tokens that come back and a little bit of error management as well. But you can get a sense like, right, Firebase does a whole lot. So this is the resource that you want to just find and look through when you want to get started using Firebase authentication for your own apps. So this is one resource, the, the Firebase readme, which is always a good place to look. The second resource I'll mention, though, the plugin also has a, a series of demo applications that have just real world examples of each of these features in use. And on the simulator here, so I've actually installed the demo and the, the readme has instructions for how to run the demo app, but I've got the Firebase demo running here. And there's, it, there's basically a giant list of doing these things uh, sort of live and in action. And for the authentication section, you'll see, for example, if you wanted to see how to use Google for login, there's an example that's just baked directly into this app. Uh, there's one for Facebook login as well. Uh, Apple login, that's actually new to the plugin. If you need to add sign in with Apple to your apps, the plugin now supports that and using that, uh, as well as some of these other workflows that you'll see in here as well. So hopefully this gives you an idea of just how easy Firebase makes it to add user management to your application. Now, before we wrap up, let's take a real quick look at the final feature on our list, and that's Firebase Analytics. Now, as you might imagine, I, I'm going to start like, I'm going to start sounding like a broken record. Uh, the best place to look when you're starting with any of these features is again, the readme of the Firebase plugin. And so there is a section on analytics. And I could walk through this and I could show you how to enable analytics in the Acme app. But there is one sort of important caveat to be aware of when you're using analytics in Firebase. And that's that your analytics events in the console are updated sort of periodically. Uh, they're not real time. So if I put this in the Acme app and started using them, uh, you wouldn't get a whole lot of data. You wouldn't see the data immediately. We'd have to wait a handful of hours. And the Acme app is also just a silly little testing app. So the analytics data it collects, collects wouldn't be especially interesting anyways. So instead, Eddie Verbruggen, who we're going to be hearing from here in a minute, 
gave me access to a pretty popular app that he has deployed to the iOS App Store in Google Play named NativeScript Plugins. So this is out in the stores. It, it's a fun little app to check out if you're uh, sort of interested in, in some of the plugins to see what NativeScript can do. But Eddie has Firebase installed in this app, and he has Firebase Analytics installed for this plugin as well. So with that in mind, if I head back to my console and switch back to my projects, you'll see that I have very super secret access to the NativeScript plugin showcase and access, if I scroll down on the side, to the analytics of this project as well. And I'm just going to quickly skim through this to give you an idea of what you can get with really a handful of lines of code. So in this case, we're getting active users of this plugin over the last, uh, in this case, 28 days, but you can uh, filter this to be different time periods. You can do things like track, uh, toggle, <laughs> track different events. Like Eddie's, Eddie's tracking, uh, for example, show directions. There's a, a mapping plugin that's in this app and he's tracking how often people use it. Uh, user engagement. There is crash reporting that's built into this as well. So if you want to track whether um, your users are successfully using your app, you can do that as well. Uh, release uh, version adoption. So are people upgrading? User retention, user location. So where your users are located, what devices they're using, uh, what interests they have. Uh, this one's actually a little bit creepy. I don't necessarily know how Firebase gets this, but hey, it's available. Uh, platform breakdown as well. It, actually kind of interesting to me that almost an exact 50-50 split between uh, this app for iOS and Android. But for a developer audience, I guess that makes a whole lot of sense. Now, there are more here. There are more uh, sort of uh, deeper dives into each of these individual features that you can find on these pages. And obviously, in a few minutes today, we're not going to be able to, to really dive into each of these individual analytic features in depth. The reason that I wanted to show you this today is just to give you a quick taste of what Firebase allows in just giving you the ability to easily track all of this information and to have this all living in the same place as your data if you're using Firestore to store your data and authentication if you're using Firebase's user management as well as the many other Firebase features. Hopefully you've gotten a sense of just how powerful Firebase is and just how easy it is to integrate into your NativeScript apps. And that applies whether you're using Firestore to store and retrieve data, Firebase authentication for user management, or Firebase analytics to gather information about your app and your users. But we are really are just scratching the surface of what Firebase can do and I'm saving the really fun stuff for Eddie to show you here in a minute. But first, I'm going to toss things back to Rob. Sweet. Thank you so much, TJ. Now, I'd like to shift gears and send things over to Eddie Verbruggen. Many of you already know Eddie via his extensive collection of Cordova and NativeScript plugins. Chances are, if you've developed an app with Cordova, Ionic, or NativeScript, you've used one of his plugins. Eddie, the stage is yours. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks, TJ, as well, because I learned a thing or two today, so that's awesome. And thank you for sticking around for my more advanced Firebase features bit. So what I'm going to cover today is Firebase hosting, cloud functions, in-app messaging, and I'll top it off with MLKit. So without further ado, let's just dive into hosting. Um, this is actually a bit of an odd one to cover because it doesn't really have anything to do with native script, but it gets more interesting uh, because this is not only static site hosting, but you can also make it dynamic by integrating it with your uh, current Firebase authentication setup, uh, Firestore, real-time database, and also cloud functions, which I'll be talking about in a bit. So you can really make your static site dynamic. So the headlines here are, okay, we're backed by an SSD and we have a global content delivery. And this is also very nice. You get free SSL and you get to use your own custom domain, which is pretty convenient. So let me show you how this works real quick. I have this native script app over here in VS Code uh, where it, one of the folders is a hosting folder. And obviously this can also uh, be a standalone folder it doesn't have to be in your current project but this is just the way i structured it and then there will be a, a public folder with an index html and well this can be just any uh, html content you can think of content you can think of so um 
yes, you can host this online, but before you push it out there in the real world, you might want to test this locally. So when you take the steps that are, I mean, the documentation of Firebase is second to none. So it's really easy to get this set up with the fire, install the Firebase tools, etc. I'm just going to assume we've already did that. It's, it's really uh, just walk through this tutorial and, and you'll be set up in five minutes or something. So to run the site locally, you run Firebase Surf. Firebase Surf will uh, give you a local endpoint. You can click that and well, hey, there's your website. So you can fiddle around, of course, with these. I have this native suite logo over here. I'll change the size a bit and then refresh it. And then, hey, there's your new uh, logo. So that's all nice. And if you want to deploy it, Firebase deploy, give it a description, smaller logo, and then uh, Firebase will run a few commands. And when it's done, it will be instantly available out there. So let that run for a bit, finalizing, releasing, and there you go. It also gives you the hosting URL in case you forget, and then please open the link. And this is the public website. You can go here right now and you'll see a similar page. Um, so this is not the best domain ever, right? Firebaseapp.com, but I've also added a custom, custom domain to this. This is my company, comedes.com. Uh, but it has a different prefix. I'm not even sure what the prefix is, but that's where I wanted to go for the next bit. Um, this is the Firebase console. You've seen this before in TDS talk, uh, but now let's dive into the hosting bit. So this is the hosting uh, dashboard for this app. And I've added a custom domain to it. So it was a bit different than I tried previously. This is the correct custom domain. And there you see the website as well. So let's go back to the dashboard. Um, when you say, okay, connect to a new domain, it will ask you for the domain name. You have to add a few things to your own DNS and then uh, well, you're done. It's, it's so simple. And Firebase will provision the SSL certificate for you. So you don't have to worry about that. So that's really cool. What's also very cool is that I, uh, released uh, a new uh, version of my logo before and I can roll that back to an older version. So if I would click for instance on this line here, I say roll back, then this one is the, now the current one and you'll see that if I refresh the, let's do the online version, this page, then you see the old logo again. So that's Firebase hosting. It's really simple. It just works really excellently, I think. So take a look at that feature. It also supports um, multiple domains on one uh, website, stuff like that. So it's really convenient and you get some insight into what your storage size is, um, how, how much traffic you've generated. And um, as with most things in the Firebase suite, there's a very generous um, um, free tier as well. So it has to be a pretty popular site before you need to pay anything to Google. So that's hosting out of the way. Let's look at cloud functions. So cloud functions are uh, like your serverless backend in the cloud, right? And this page has um, some really decent information on them. And an interesting bit here is that ways to trigger a cloud function are, for instance, by analytics events or um, cloud storage triggers, which I show you, show you how to use those in a bit. And also a pretty common case, HTTP trigger. So you call some uh, HTTP endpoint and uh, a cloud function runs. So these cloud functions are created in JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, you deploy them with Google and there's, they advertise it as zero maintenance. I can attest to that because I have a few running in production and I never need to look at them actually. And a good case for uh, creating a cloud function instead of processing the same code on your mobile device would, for instance, be if you have to invoke a third party service, which requires uh, an API secret, you might not want to bundle those with your app, but rather keep them secure. Um, so there's a lot of info 
in here, but an interesting page for you to look at if you like is what you can do with functions. This gives you a few use cases. You can look at how you can use those in your own situation. For instance, if a user signs up or follows another user in your app, then you can send a push notification to the other user that he has a new follower, etc., etc. So, but let's dive into a bit of code, shall we? So we were looking at the Firebase console uh, hosting menu. Let's go to functions instead. And there you can see that I have deployed three very simple HTTP triggered functions over here. Hello world, hello name, and hello world JSON. So in my project, I have this Firebase functions folder, which has a source folder, and there's my index.ts. And like I said, you can also write uh, JavaScript as well. So here you can see the same three functions. You simply export them, and that's uh, how those get registered with Firebase. So this is the um, HTTPS triggered version, but like I said, you can also trigger them based on Firestore events or storage events or what have you. And in this case, whenever I call this Hello World uh, service, I get a request and response object to do something with, and I simply respond with hello from Firebase and echo any query param named text. So if you want to run these, you can use the same command as you used with hosting. So that will be Firebase serve, and then you can test those functions locally. So let's give it a sec. There you go. Those three functions are deployed. And when you click it, it will just open a browser. Hello from Firebase, undefined. So that's, um, um, oh, that's this function actually, but it didn't compile this change. So if you want to do that, you would um, do, well, in this case, I can simply TSC it, run it again. And there you go. So uh, if you want to deploy those functions, it would be very similar as well to uh, hosting. So that would be simply Firebase deploy, and then your function is published. Um, ah, testing, that's an interesting thing as well. Um, you can create a test folder uh, and then use your favorite test framework uh, ever. So you can then run npm run test, which is a script I added over here to the package JSON. Here you go, it's just a mock up test. And then you can run those tests and it looks like I have an error because I probably changed something again uh, because it tries to find hello from Firebase Eddie and there's an exclamation mark in there. So let me, that's what you do, right? If your test fail, don't change your production code, always change the test. <laughs> so I'm just kidding. So if you run test and now everything runs uh, correctly. Uh, so these are simple unit tests, but you can also use uh, live data. You can also mock data from your Firestore, for instance. So this is pretty powerful stuff. Speaking of powerful stuff, let's look at a more elaborate example. I have this app over here, which is called uh, Football Player Ratings. And let me log on to the app before I show you the app, otherwise you know what my password is. So let me drag this in here. So this is, this is the app, and um, in this page, you can change your profile picture. Um, what we want to do here is show a nice football player card where your profile picture looks like a FIFA card. So it looks a bit more interesting. But the problem with creating a, taking a selfie is there will always be a background and you want to remove that so it looks nice on that card. So that's where this Firebase function comes in. So I have a few in here and this, this is the function I'm, I'm talking about. In this case, we're going to export a function called remove background, which uses this awesome library called remove.bg, uh, which is, that's a free tier um, as well. So if you're not going overboard with a lot of uh, requests to their API, then 
every month you get a, a few credits for free. It's a, it's a pretty cool a machine learning powered uh, API. So what we do here is we uh, we listen for a storage trigger in this case. So that's the um, uh, Firebase storage. And when an object is stored and finalized, uh, we are going to download that object from the storage bucket and then uh, remove the background and then put it back again, actually. So here we get the bucket. We uh, store it locally. We download it over here. And then we call this API, remove background from image file, and then uh, pass the API key, which you want to keep secret. And then we get it back and it will tell us uh, how many credits it has consumed as well. And then we create a new file and upload that to the storage bucket again. And then, well, then we're done. We have to also update the record in Firestore in this case, but that's not relevant for this function. So let's see how actually how quickly this all works by updating my profile picture. So let me snag a pic over here, change it to the front camera. I have this cool NativeScript developer day t-shirt. So let's get it in there as well. Left a bit and then use this picture. So now watch closely. It's uploading the picture to the bucket. Then this function will run, it will download it, it will send it to the API, it will upload that picture again, and then it will uh, also update this record over here, because it's Firestore and has listeners. So that's that. And now I have to move this out of the way again, because I have to log out and log in again, because there's a bug in there, which doesn't immediately update that player card, but here we're logged in again, and you see, okay, my arms are missing, but you get a general ID, right? So that's a pretty powerful stuff. Uh, I guess, yeah, that's it for Firebase Cloud Functions. And let's get over to the next one, in-app messaging. So in-app messaging, which is not to be confused with push notifications or local notifications, is more of a rich UI. You can show when the user is in your app as opposed to your app being in the background or not running at all. Um, and these are pretty nice, actually, and they're really easy to set up, and I'll show you in a second. So you can send uh, messages uh, to um, audiences you select and then customize those uh, messages as well. You can also add a button and then you, your app code can respond to whether or not that button was clicked. So let's hop on over to the Firebase console. Uh, I have to load a different project because that's where my example lives and then hop on over to wherever in-app messaging resides in here. So that's here. And I've got one pre-configured for my app. And let's see, I'm still using the iOS version. So let's look at this one. And let me see, there must be a way to somehow configure these. I sometimes get lost in this console. <laughs> There's so much in here. Um, let's see, oh here, edit. All right, so compose campaign. <clears throat> um, so you get to choose the style and the content, but the very nice thing about it is that you get a very good preview over here. We can preview them on the iPad and the iPhone, also in landscape if you like. So what I configured here is uh, some Star Wars uh, funny thingy uh, where I offer you to buy a lightsaber for $99, which is probably a pretty good deal. You get to configure uh, the colors and, and also the action uh, that's being clicked, uh, oh, that's being sent to your app when the button is clicked. After which you can select an audience. Um, in this case, I want to target the iOS app. And there's a few more things you can do. You can also trigger them by analytics events or whatnot. And in this case, um, I say, okay, you can start it at this and this date and at that date. So like, you can imagine that you, for instance, have uh, holiday uh, promotions or something that you only want to run uh, when it's Christmas. And then you can say, okay, I want to 
um, send this, um, show this notification when the app goes to the foreground. But like I said, you can also hook this to uh, analytics conversion events like in-app purchases or, or whatever, and then show the message. And I don't want to show it more than one message every day. So there's a lot to configure over here. And then when the button is clicked, you can also, again, um, trigger another event. Um, so this integrates really nice with analytics, actually. And then you get to publish it, and, and that's it. So uh, let me show you on my simulator. Oh, it, it would be nice if I would have still had that preview up. So this is what it looks like in the preview. And I've set it to um, display when you resume the app only once a day. So I didn't do it yet today. So come to close it and then show it again. And then, hey, there's your message. And it looks pretty similar to what I was seeing in the Firebase console. So that's very nice. So at the very top here, you can see, OK, the campaign by a lightsaber has been seen. So that's what this one is called. And now let's move over to Visual Studio to see how you would set that up. So this is my demo view app, which is also like all these demos I'm showing you here are uh, in the um, GitHub repo of the NativeScript Firebase plugin. Also the hosting and the functions code is in there. So you can take a look whenever you like, if you like. So what you need to do to set up in-app messaging is uh, really only a few things in your main file where you start your app you import or sorry you require the plugin and then just in it firebase like you need to do whenever you have this plugin installed so that's it uh, for this bit and then in your component where you would like to uh, interact with the in-app uh, message uh, you um, import in a messaging from the firebase plugin and then wire up, if you like, that's optional, but you probably want to do it, uh, an on message impression event. So there's that event and come on. Intelligence is not feeling like helping me out over here, but there's two events, on message impression and on message clicked. So, and when a message is being shown, the campaign mm -hmm, has been seen, message is being set. So that was what you were seeing over here at the top. And now when I click that button on my phone, the campaign mm -hmm, has been clicked event is being uh, set in the message. So, um, I mean, this is the API I came up with for this um, feature, and I'm not sure if it would be able to I would be able to do it any easier than this so I hope you find this useful um, and uh, yeah let's move on over to the last bit which is also pretty interesting ML kit so with ML kit Google has made it relatively easy to add machine learning capabilities to your app and there's a lot of features you can add and they are constantly adding features as well and I'll get to that in a second and you can see that uh, many of these features can actually run on a device and others can run in the cloud. And the advantage of on device is that obviously you get your results back a bit quicker. Uh, but the downside is that it's a little less accurate than running it in the cloud because the cloud models are a bit more complicated. Uh, so, but still, I must say the on device recognition is pretty damn awesome. Uh, and let me show you a few examples of this. Um, so for this, let's um, try this on Android, actually. And here's my device, and here's my demo ng app, which is also in the repo. And let's see, barcode scanning is a pretty common use case, right? So you can grab barcodes from the camera stream. Um, and I don't have any lying around, so let me open up. A QR code page and an EN13 page, because in this case the app is configured to recognize those. Let me move this to the right a bit, and then I somehow managed to landscape my simulator thing. So, come on, so here we go again. So, when I move this 
barcode into the frame, you'll see that it's really quick. It can recognize multiple barcodes simultaneously, which is pretty cool. And also EN13s over here, and also UPC a because those are pretty similar to EN13. So Google thinks those are EN13s as well. So that's barcode scanning. And let me quickly show you what the code's like because the code for all of these ML kit features are pretty much the same. So this is the view and um, that view at the top, let me bring it up again. Here's the, the action bar which is barcode scanning over here. And then um, there's this ML kit view um, below it. And in this case, it's barcode scanning. And here you can configure which types of barcodes it needs to recognize. And there's a whole list of them and they're all documented in the plugin docs. And then the bit below here, the blue scanner UI, is just this grid layout over here, which is overlaid on top of the barcode scanner view because using a grid layout, with views which have the same um, row um, number, then they will be stacked on top of each other. So uh, when the plugin uh, throws the scan result event, uh, you tap into the on barcode scan result event, which was a function which is configured here in your TypeScript code. And this will just echo the list of barcodes it found back to the screen. So it's all very similar, all these um, all these APIs for demo kit in the, in the plugin. Uh, let me show you another nice example. Not for that, I'll have to create a new file. Let's call it blah.txt because I want to do some text recognition over here. And let's type some Dutch. So that's Dutch, and you can probably guess what this last word is, but maybe not the other bits, although it's not too hard, maybe. <laughs> and let's see, let's take a picture of the back camera. Thank you very much. Here we go. Let's make sure there's no other text in this frame. Ik hou van chocolade. All right. So let's ask MLKit which language this actually is. Language identification, it comes back with that's Dutch. All right, that's perfect because I can translate Dutch to English. So MLKit will do some OCR for you. And when you press the text translation button, it will tell you, I like chocolate. The first time, which is correct actually, the first time you run this on your device and you didn't use text translation before, it will automatically download the model for you, uh, but that's all handled by the plugin. And so it will be a bit slower, but any other consecutive time, it will be yeah, lightning fast, really. So a pretty cool new feature that I'd like to show you as well is called AutoML. And for that, I go back to iOS again, because I just added this feature. I saw this feature yesterday, and I'm currently implementing it in the 10.3.0 version of the plugin. Uh, and what this will do is, and I need to go to the Firebase console for this, is um, an easy way for you to train your TensorFlow uh, light models. Because you could also use a custom model uh, of your own, but to train those and to uh, uh, generate the light file, TF light files, there's a lot of uh, nasty Python commands involved, etc. It's pretty hard to pull off, actually. So uh, this new feature called AutoML, it makes it a lot easier, actually. So what you can do is you add a data set. Uh, I don't know, you call it a car, for instance. And then it will prompt you to upload a bunch of images. So you'll create a, a directory locally uh, with uh, car brands or whatnot, and then a lot of pictures for each car. It, it requires at least 10 pictures for, for each uh, label you want to recognize. Otherwise, I mean, there's a lot of lightning conditions and uh, colors and, and everything, and you want all of those to uh, be recognized as a certain car. 
So uh, after uploading all these things, uh, you just press next, next, and then Google will do the training for you. And at the end of the day, you can download a model. So I did that for my, uh, my model called left, right, which is extremely silly. So I, I thought, let's try to do, uh, to recognize whether my head is tilted left or right depending on uh, the mirroring you're looking at, um, to do some, I don't know, maybe a navigation in my app or something. Because with those grid, grid layouts, you can actually hide the camera view entirely and, and just not show it, but you can still uh, recognize if, if, if the person is leaning left or right. So that's what I try to do, but I must say I have a really sore neck by now because of all the training I did this morning. Uh, I don't mean physical training, but training the damn model and testing it so i'm just going to uh, run this off a image i created earlier so uh, where's the app here's the app um so here's the camera feed and i can do uh, auto ml and there you go so uh, i also had to have this picture over here where are you it must be I kind of lost the picture. That's great. Let me see. Sorry for my messy desktop. Uh, it must be, oh, here it is. This is this is what I trained. So this is left. Yeah, those are all left. One of those said right actually, which is a bit weird. And now it's all fine. So it thinks that's all left and then i have my right set as well and there you go these are all right pretty cool so so what i what i did was actually this is the actual data set i uploaded to to google and then it uh, generated the model for me i hosted that with my app um, because that's uh, let me see um, where are you in the app resources folder is this model where there's only two labels it can recognize left to right and then there's this i think it's five megabytes or something model or three megabytes model where all the magic is going on so this is pretty cool and if, if i would train this with a thousand pictures maybe based on a camera stream which you can dump to images then I think you would be able to build a really decent model uh, with this feature. So this is ML Kit. Um, yeah, please play with it. It's a pretty cool tech. And um, I guess that's it for me now. I'm not going to waste any more of your time. And let's go back to Rob. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks very much, Eddie. And thank you again, TJ. Sorry, guys, but I couldn't help sharing this glorious picture of you both with the entire world. Well, I personally have the distinct honor of winding this webinar down, but before we leave, I have two quick things to show you. I fully realize Eddie just gave a nice run through of MLKit, but I thought it might be fun to look at some parts of a native script app I built for fun that is now in the app stores. Yes, it's all free, don't worry. I'm not trying to make a buck off of you here. The app is called Hoppy, and the basic premise is that you can use MLKit to scan a beer menu to identify beer names then we can use the untapped API to gather beer ratings. So say you're in a restaurant and you aren't familiar with any beers on a menu, in theory, using this app, you'll be able to identify maybe one or two with some decent ratings. Again, in theory, but let's see how this works in the real world. So this is Hoppy. Now the first thing I need to do is actually authenticate myself with untapped. So you do need an untapped account, which is free and everything, but just so you know, that's one little catch to the process. After I've authenticated, I can either scan an individual beer barcode, or the cool part here, though, is to snap a picture of a drink menu. So I am going to use my device camera here. And no, I'm not in a bar right now. I just happen to have a printout of a sample menu that I will use. Let's use that photo. Now it's going to send this data to the mystical cloud here. And let's see what we get returned from untapped. So... Here is a list of the beers that MLKit thinks that it retrieved from the menu. Now, if you look really closely and you can compare it to the menu that I showed previously, you'll see that the, the hit rate is not 
perfect. It's going to depend a lot on the menu you're using as well as the interpretation of the font and the text and everything from MLKit, from the OCR with MLKit. So your results may vary here, but it's kind of cool, kind of fun thing to work with. But if you tap on an individual beer, you can get some details about it as well. You can also open the beer details in Untapped to see a lot more information and access kind of the social features of Untapped as well. So let's take a look at some of the code to see how this was built using MLKit from Firebase. Cool, so the demo is pretty okay. Not amazing, but not horrible. Uh, but I did want to show off a little bit of the code so you can see how easy this was to do. The first important step is for us to use the device camera to snap a picture of the menu. Of course, this is one of the important aspects and advantages of NativeScript as we get cross-platform access to native device APIs with this really simple JavaScript code. So after requesting permissions to use the camera, yes, this is very much a required step. We can take a picture. This can be from the camera or from the images stored on the device. Then I simply hit this analyze picture method. This is where the magic happens. When I analyze my picture, I'm using MLKit to pull text out of the image provided with OCR. In this case, I'm creating a new image source from this image asset, which is what I need to pass to the recognize text cloud method. And in said recognize text cloud method, I simply pass that image along with a model type, whether I want the bleeding edge text recognition model or the most more stable version. I can also control how many results are returned from the image provided. In my case, I know that a lot of text appears on menus, so I'm leaving this open to about 25 results. Now here's where my code gets a little sketchy. MLKit is gonna return a lot of text and a lot of it won't make much sense. So I'm using some regular expressions to filter out strings I know are invalid and kind of trimming it up to be as valid as possible before I hit the untapped API to get my rankings. Now once I've processed the data as best I can on the device, I ping the untapped API for beer ratings and images and brewery info based on the name of the beer that I'm passing. Finally, after I populate my list view of possible beers, I of course want to show the details of the beer, and this just shows how I add some navigation context for this individual list item to pass along. And I navigate to that detail view and pass along the navigation context I generated. I do really like this example as it was super easy for me to get up and running with one little component of Firebase and use it for what I consider a mildly entertaining purpose. Cheers. Now finally, I did promise a Steve Jobs-esque one last thing. I know that many of you today are using NativeScript Sidekick, especially on Windows, to help you with some of the tedious tasks of app development. Maybe it's icon and splash screen management. Maybe it's plugins. Maybe creating cloud-based builds for iOS or Android or even delivering production-ready apps to the app stores. What we know and love about Sidekick is not changing. However, we are in the midst of planning and working towards what we're calling Sidekick 2.0. So Sidekick 2.0, as we see it today, is a natural extension of Sidekick 1.0. We want to make it easier than ever before for you to quickly scaffold NativeScript app views and bind those views to your data. Specifically, we plan on allowing you to build your apps based on data models you've already created in Firebase or Progress Kinbay. We want to provide a full visual app designer that allows you to build views from scratch by dragging and dropping UI elements and layouts onto a canvas, or even choose from a set of predefined and pre-wired views. And we know that app navigation can be a pain you don't want to deal with, so providing some visual tools to help with tab or drawer-based navigation is really critical as well. Finally, of course, all the features you currently use in Sidekick 1 are going to be there, from cloud builds to image generation to plugin and settings management. So if you're interested in being part of this journey with us, just head to bit.ly slash sidekick-2. Here you'll find a short form you can fill out to be notified when we are ready for folks to start kicking the tires. We're also scheduling some one-on-one -on -one calls with people to get an idea of the pain points we can help solve with Sidekick 2.0. Well, that is all from us today. Remember, if you'd like to get early access to Sidekick 2.0, just head to bit.ly slash sidekick-2. Otherwise, thank you, TJ. Thank you, Eddie. It's always a pleasure. And thank you all so much for attending. And have a great rest of your day.